Yes, we're on. Okay, so welcome to today's session, looking at advocacy under the CARE Act. Um, we're going to do a little quick poll. Could you tell me if you are working as a, an advocate under the CARE Act? So if you're working currently as a care act advocate, yes, uh, no, and uh, not any plans, or if you're about to start and this is kind of part of your training support. So just give me a bit of feedback. Oh, hi, Kirsty, you managed to log in okay? That's great. Okay, so we've got a mixture of experience. Not everybody's filled that in. Yes, we're in. Okay, we're going to publish it now. Um, so there's a mixture of people. Lovely. Right, well, today's session, we are going to be looking at um, a brief overview of what the CARE Act um, intended to do. Um, and I'm acutely aware that as we go through the main aims of the CARE Act, I'm going to be saying to you quite a lot today that um, a lot of these things aren't happening. And I want you to bear in mind this um, as advocates, we've got a role to play in making sure that the provisions of the Care Act are adequately delivered on. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to keep that quite broad that session uh, these slides to look at what the Care Act promises and what the duties on local authorities are, and um, what 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 they're meant to do. And then we're going to look at eligibility for advocacy. So who who can get an advocate? Who's legally entitled to get one? Does that sound okay? Yes, sounds incredible. Am I spoiling you with this incredible content? Yes, yes. Marvellous. Okay, so first thing to say about the CARE Act is that it's what we call um, a reforming piece of legislation because it um, changes the law and introduces new things. But it also um, is referred to a consolidating piece of legislation because what it did is it came at a time when there were lots of um, pieces of legislation that dealt with different things and it all needed to be brought into one place. So what the CARE Act did is it repealed a lot of previous laws. So I'm just going to show you a quick list. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but it's just important that you have a feel that the CARE Act, uh, yes, introduced new things, but then also repealed a lot and kind of amalgamated a lot. And the, the two I mean, they're all relevant, but um, I think the NHS Community Care Act and the Carers Act were, were um, very, very important and they, they've been repealed by this Care Act. So these acts now are no longer in existence, if you like, they're not, um, it's not the correct terminology, is, but they, they're, they're not relevant anymore. Um, and it was the same for secondary legislation and guidance that had previously been issued. Um, and these... Uh, or yeah, have all been um, su su succeeded really. They, they've been repealed and replaced by the Care Act. Is that all making sense? As always, if you've got questions, please interrupt. I'd much rather we kept this uh, interactive and informal. So if you've got questions, pop them in the box as we go. Okay, so what does the Care Act do? So there are some big headlines that as advocates, it's important that, that you um, understand that the first is that the care act outlines a single eligibility threshold for care and support and this this was really really important at the time because prior to this you had um on the previous slide the fair access to care services this one down at the bottom where the red dot is and that basically was applied um locally and my understanding, because I've got to admit, I, I didn't really use it at, at the time, but th my understanding is that it was built on things like um, need, need that was described as um, crisis and urgent or severe. Um, and it really depended on what parts of the country you were as to how they define that, depending on the needs, the demand, I think. Um, what the CARE Act did, and this is the important bit, is the CARE Act... Um, it, it 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 says this there's one threshold for care and support to have your needs met and that doesn't matter where you are now the threshold itself for, for having eligible needs um is 
is fairly straightforward. We don't go into detail today. We're going to look at that in this webinar that looks at the assessment process under the CARE Act. But for now, um, it's just enough for me to say how how assessment uh, how the eligibility is worked out is that the person has to show that they've got needs that they've got needs for care and support that's arrived from a disability or which includes mental health um, and then because of those needs they're unable to achieve certain things and there's a list in the care act of i think 10 outcomes and they cover things like being able to dress yourself being able to cook for yourself and manage your own nutrition um, being kept, being able to keep yourself safe, um, access and work and education, um, and join relationships, all, all these things. And what the care act is saying is that if because of your disability you cannot achieve them, and then because of that your well-being impacts it is impacted on, then you have needs eligible needs for care and support. And that doesn't matter where you are. That threshold, that assessment process is the same. Um, and that's in the primary legislation. So that's really, really important. But as I say, we're going to go into a lot more detail of that in the webinar that looks at the assessment process and the advocacy role. But for now, let's get back to the broad headlines of Care Act. The second thing the Care Act does is it requires local authorities. So th this is a duty on local authorities to provide people with information and advice. And it requires local authorities to help the individual to understand their rights. It also requires local authorities to help people plan for, for future needs. I'm going to come back to this because this is one of the big things that ain't happening. Um, and I think we've, we can have um, an influence in that. We, we can, yeah, we can hopefully change that. The third thing the Care Act does, Emily's asked a question, is the Care Act specific to adults or does it cover children as well? Is there separate legislation relating to children? What a brilliant question. Um, so the care act predominantly deals with adult services and in uk legislation you are classed as an adult uh, anybody know what age oh question for 10 points how old are you when you are classed as an adult 18 yeah correct so you can get married and pay taxes before 18 um but no it's 18 so you um yeah it's all weird at the ages but in the uk you are legally classed as an adult at 18. so what we've got is um different legislation that covers different age groups you've got the mental capacity act which kicks in at 16 and above maybe susan if you work with mental capacity you're you're thinking 16 because i meant the Mental capacity act kicks in at 16, um, but there are special rules for 16, 17 year olds under capacity legislation. But um, other than that, you're 18. You've got an overlap between children's legislation, and I'm going to pop in here um, a couple of key um, pieces of. Oh, so it's Children Act 2004, Children Families Act. I can't remember what year it was. Um, it might be 2007. Right, I made that up. Um, I think there's a Social Work Act, Children's Social Work Act. And that was quite recently. Do you know what? I'm gonna I am gonna look them up because um, I'm really recalling them off the top of my head. But for children's legislation, you've got um, you've got loads of, of different bits um, and, and guidance and it, different pieces of legislation. You know deal with different things but essentially they all deal with children young people up to the age of 18 they then go up their extenders to the age of 24 for children and young people have got additional needs so the the two main groups there are, are care leavers and young people with disabilities who are transitioning to adult services now the care act kind of mirrors that uh, i think children families that was 2014 actually because it was the same year as the care act if I remember rightly. So yeah, Children and Families Act 2014, same as the Care Act 2014, and see them both as kind of uh, being two sides of, of a mirror, if you like. You've got the Children and Families Act that goes from 0 to 18, 24 for young people with disabilities and care leavers. And then you've got the Care Act, which goes from 18 upwards. Um, but actually, um, 
can start a little bit earlier for young people with disabilities. And the reason for that is because young people with disabilities, if they're going to need support as an adult, then there needs to be that transition between services, children and adult services, a transition between the Children and Families Act and the Care Act. And what both pieces of legislation um, are setting out to do is to make it um, easy for case by case decisions to be taken around which one's more suitable for that particular child. Um, what the Care Act says is that transition planning should start by the 16th birthday. And the greater complex needs of the young person, the earlier that should start. So it can start from 14. Um, but when the young person hits 16 and it's obvious that they're going to have needs as, a, as an adult, then they are entitled to an assessment under the CARE Act. Um, and it really is a case by case um, decision. I, I'm, I'm aware that sometimes young people's entitlements to support are better under children's legislation. Uh, so we're not looking at the kind of the, the ethics of that. But um, if you're a care leaver, you might be entitled to more support. Um, through, and things like shared lives don't are uh, governed by young people's legislation, not adults, I think. Not shared lives, sorry, staying put. Staying put arrangements, that's for kids in foster care. They can stay put with their foster carers uh, past 18. Um, I think I've given you a really long answer to that question, <laughs> which might have been, yeah, there is separate legislation, but I hope that makes sense. Uh, but in essence, Care Act is for 18 and above, but it can kick in a bit before. And the other group that the Care Act deals with for young people will be young carers. Now, carers in the Care Act, it, it's not defined by age. So it, it's, you know, if you're an unpaid care, if you're taking on any caring role uh, for, for, for family friends, then, then you're an unpaid carer. And it doesn't say po um, 18, it does say adult carers, it just says carers. So we know then that the, the provisions of the Care Act are relevant for young carers. Now, again, there's a crossover between the Children and Families Act that deals with young carers. So we want to just be sensible. We're not talking about, you know, um, every young carer. But the idea is that if the young carer is going to be a carer in their adulthood. So let's say you've got a 17 year old who um, is approaching their 18th birthday and they they take on care and responsibilities for mum who has a physical disability, let's say. And it's likely that that 17 year old is going to continue to have care responsibilities as an adult. So they're going to continue as an 18, 19 year old to care for mum. Then that young care is entitled to an assessment and support if they're eligible under the Care Act. If they're 17 and they are caring for um, a disabled parent, and let's say that they're going to move out um, next year after their 18th birthday that's the plan then you wouldn't be accessing the provisions of the care act because they're not going to be a carer as an adult and um, does that make sense so it's about the way i understand it is if the young person's gonna basically need the care act when they're an adult then they can start to access the care act provisions before their 18th birthday and that's meant to be um to help with transition, to make things smooth, to make plans, you know, put plans in place before things hit crisis. Um, and one of the big things we're going to look at at a minute is this idea of preventing need. And if you think about um, delaying need and preventing the escalation of needs, then um, that's what, sorry, I've got the doorbell going, um, then that's what the, um, the Care Act is, is designed to be doing. OK, let's get back to the slide. So people in prison, um, before the Care Act, there was some ambiguities around um, who meets um, prisoners' needs, who have uh, needs for care and support. Um, and the Care Act makes it very clear that it's a local responsibility, local authority. Uh, they're on a duty to um, assess people in prison if they've got um, disabilities or needs and to meet those needs if they're eligible. This bullet point here is really, really important um, because 
what the care act does is it recognised in law that um, the needs of a carer um, is on an equal footing with the care for person and it recognises this uh, without carers um, people with the needs the care carer the cared for person um, that their lives would be um, perhaps much more complex and not um, not what they might want it without the support of carers so what the government was recognising at the time was that we needed to put support into carers and recognise them um, to help everybody now this is something else that is problematic because we know um, there was research done last week wasn't it, I think by the Alzheimer's Society that um, I saw on the, the, the BBC you know saying that oh, you know millions and millions of hours of unpaid support um, and carers aren't getting the, the, the help that they need and advocacy we can help with that because carers are entitled to advocacy and we'll look at that a bit later um okay this last one which we're going to revisit is the, the the kind of the principle of the care act if there is one uh, about prevention believe it or not so the the care act talks about um putting in support early and saying that local authorities should really um, offer support to people early to prevent the development and the onset of need rather than only getting involved at the crisis point when everything's going wrong and again i think you know i've i'm got a really i suppose healthy cynicism about that because we we don't always see that we only often see things get into crisis point before the local authority will will do anything but the technically um the care act requires the local authority to 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 intervene early uh, and again i'm going i'm going to come back to this because it is really topical i think okay any questions on these points so far shook them in if you do okay so new things that the care act introduced um i don't think i can probably call them new anymore because it's 2019 and we've been we've had this now for what well this will be four years won't it um so we've got this new duty new duty to prevent meet the need for care and support we've got a new duty of providing advice and information um the new duty to manage provider failure so that that came in response to and i can't remember the name of the company but there was a company in about 2013 or 2012 that went bust and it basically meant that thousands of people across the country didn't have a, it was a care home provider oh what do they call it we go the h anybody you know um, but they were they were busting thousands of people overnight, basically lost their home and, and care and support. And it was you know it was huge news at, at the time, and the, the the government had to step in and um, you know basically intervene and um, to to make sure people were safe. So what the Care Act did is it introduced this requirement on local authorities to to be responsible for to commissioners are um, have a duty to check things like the financial uh, viability and the business planning of, of these care providers and puts them gives them duties to to step in and manage that situation if there's a risk of the provider failing if that makes sense um i'm i'm not, I'm not f aware of any big things that have happened since the care act under this so i will I'll, I'll, I'll just move on. The next new duty is something called market shaping. I don't know if anybody's heard of, of market shaping, but market shaping is this idea that commissioners um, are required now to look locally at the demands of the population for care and support and to then influence the market and shape it so that they um, to the, the services that the local population needs are available. Now, I think that that is really interesting for advocates because if you think about unmet need, if you think about all the people you support and all the things that they might need or want to have a good life that aren't available locally. Now, if you're getting data on these services, on this unmet need, there's nothing to stop you going to your commissioner and saying, look, we've, I, we've seen a, a trend in our local area, whether that's libraries or, you know, swimming pools or I know, dog walking, 
whatever it is, but if you're seeing that there's a demand for a particular type of care and support that isn't readily available, then I'd be going to the commissioner as an advocacy service to say, um, this is an issue and under the Care Act, you've got duties to market shape. You know, can you can you commission this? Now, it doesn't automatically follow that they're going to say, yes, Grace, thank you very much for raising this and bringing it to our attention. Off, off you go, pat on the back. But, um, but there's something I think about advocacy uh, as a sector talking to commissioners about that unmet need um, to make sure that they understand and have an insight into what it's like for, for people locally. Um, and I think commissioners often don't have that and you can be that conduit, if you like, to, to help the commissioner understand what's going on locally, if, if that makes sense. Does anybody do anything like that at the moment? Uh, does anybody talk to the commissioner around market shaping? I don't know. If you do, maybe just chuck in. No, is it something that you think you might be able to do, Kirsty? If um, and and everybody else thinking around unmet needs and what what services, what support people people are um, exploring that you, you're struggling to find, um, then yeah, talk, talk to your commissioner. So independent advocacy. We're going to move on to the next point. Um, advocacy was introduced under the Care Act. Um, oh, Chris has said, I do ask, but it seems to fall on deaf ears. Um, Alex says, our service asks us for quarterly feedback, and I suppose this is the type of thing we could raise. Uh, definitely. Um, Chris, you know, of course it falls on deaf ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, get on with it. We, um, we, 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 you just need to keep pushing, keep pushing, 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 pushing. Um, I, I know I I think I might get a sign put on my head that just says please ignore me please ignore my emails and requests for information um but it doesn't mean that we stop pushing so um yeah just use your your own inimitable advocacy style Chris and, and and keep going back to them keep going back um so Alex yeah d definitely in your quarterly feedback I think it if you think about that kind of intelligence that you want you want to be getting um intelligence from your data about what what's going on in, in that quarter and, and this is you don't have to do it every quarter but if you're seeing these themes coming up about unmet needs well then yeah I, I would then put that under your report as market shaping you know and talk quote from the care act around the duties on commissions to market shape right independent advocacy we're going to come to um in a couple of slides time but for now it's just enough to say that the Care Act extended entitlement to statutory advocacy. Um, so this is on the back of IMHA, IMCA, Care Act, it, sorry, complaints and dolls. So Care Act is another type of statutory advocacy and we'll look at the entitlement in a bit. Um, safeguarding um, had a big shift under the Care Act um, because for the first time uh, in law and primary legislation, there was a requirement on local authorities to have an adult safeguarding board. Uh, prior to the Care Act, um, most local, I think all local authorities actually had one, but it wasn't a duty. Um, and the Care Act makes very, very clear what duties are now on local authorities to, um, what actions they are required to, to take to keep people safe and to respond to concerns about, about safeguarding. Um, We've got a separate web webinar on safeguarding processes and advocacy in safeguarding, so I'll, I'll leave that content for that session. Um, and then the new thing it introduced was transition assessments, and I've, I've made some reference to this. So a transition assessment is a young person with a disability who is transitioning from children's to adult services. And what the care access is from, you know, as they are, as they're going through that transition process, then they can have an assessment under the Care Act if they want to before their 18th birthday. And as an advocate, I would be considering that and be helping the young person for those young people where it's obvious that their needs uh, are going to continue into adulthood and particularly where they're, they're complex. So they might have um, health and care needs or um, very specialist needs, then you might want that. They might want that transition to start earlier. Right, let's have a little look at prevention of needs for care and support because I I just don't think this is happening and 
please tell me if I'm wrong or if you disagree or if your experience is different. Um, but what I wanted to draw to your attention really was section two of the Care Act. And this is from the primary legislation. OK, so if you remember primary legislation is the act itself, uh, secondary legislation, the regulations. And then we've got Care Act guidance. And I am going to put the link for the Care Act guidance because it's online. Here it is. And you need to have this bookmarked in your browser and refer to it on a weekly basis to, you know, in your communications to check that the local authorities do what they need to be doing. So that's the guidance. This is from the primary legislation, the Act itself. Uh, and what it's saying, I mean, look, look at what it says. It says the local authority must doesn't say should, it says must. Local authority must provide, provide or arrange for services, etc., which will contribute towards preventing or delaying the development of care and support needs. And that's for the adult with the care and support needs and for carers. And so this isn't about meeting needs. This is a really important distinction. This is not saying that if somebody's got eligible needs, then they have to meet them. That's covered elsewhere in the, in the Care Act. This is saying that for carers and adults with, with care and support needs, that the local authority has to, must, must provide um, services, facilities, resources, um, to prevent the development of needs or to delay further needs from arising. And that could be before the person's even got needs, which I find fascinating because I don't think that this happens. Now, this is taken from the guidance. So that that's what this um, link is here in the, in the text box. So 2.6 of the guidance says that where an individual has no particular current health or care and support needs, that the local authority is under a duty to provide support that will stop you know, will we'll prevent um, those care needs from um, developing. And then the other thing is this, if the person has got needs and they're at this increased risk of uh, those needs um, kind of increasing or their needs for care and support increasing, then the local authority is under this duty to, to help to, to reduce that. Now, I just, as I say, just don't think that this this happens because of money, because of, of cost. Um, but this is in the act. And I, do you know, what? I, I wonder as, as advocates whether we are using this perhaps as much as we could to fight for, for, for people to get support uh, and services that, that they need. So I don't know if anybody's got any real world experience of perhaps somebody where they have you know that they, they they're worried that they're that they're about you know so that's gonna happen and they're gonna have needs can can i give can you give an example um no i, I don't call i haven't worked with anybody in real life um let me make up an example um so let's imagine that somebody has I don't know, just thinking maybe a mental health condition. And oh, I might have an example actually. Okay, there was a guy who um, had a mental health condition. This is pre care act, but I'm wondering whether it's relevant. He had a mental health condition and he would, um, and it was kind of exacerbated by him drinking. And when he, um, drank you know drank heavily his mental health and uh, voices and uh, suicidal um tendencies would, would 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 really come out and he'd really struggle and he'd end up um he i think he was described to me as like a revolving door patient you know he'd, he'd come into hospital get better go out start drinking again get on that cycle and come back in and it was a broker who who i knew and the, the broker was telling me this, um, he, for him, his, what made him happy and what made him um, have a sense of well-being was football. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is that um, he would 
go to the pub to watch the football. And of course, you watch football in the pub pretty much every day, sometimes three times a day over the weekend. And that was really triggering, you know, uh, making it very easy for them to drink and then the mental health would, would, would be um, triggered. So what the what they asked was for a direct payment to cover Sky TV. And when my friend told me this, I was like laughing, thinking, oh, there's no way they said yes to Sky TV so that you could watch football at home. Um, but they did. They did. They, they said yes. Um, and I'm wondering whether that would be an example of preventing um, the onset or like kind of deterioration of mental health. Um, you, you, I suppose we might say that he's got eligible needs for that anyway but it, it, it may i don't know maybe that could be a pre prevention one um but yeah and I, I suppose i'm offering this today because i'm thinking around this prevention and the, the duty for local authorities and as i say it's not something i see in advocacies um and the advocates i work with it's not something i see in, in the practice and i guess i wanted to put it on the table and say to you guys today basically be aware of it um, and secondly, look for those opportunities where you think that that might um, kick in. Um, so sorry, I can't give you a concrete example, Alex. Um, but yeah, but today I just wanted to kind of raise it and say, don't forget, Section 2 of the Care Act talks about prevention. Um, and yeah, it would be, come back to me if, if you, 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 you get an example, you know, or you work with uh, an individual where you think that this is, relevant because I do think there's something in this that, that gets missed if 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 you like. Right, let's have another similar um conversation around section four of the Care Act, which says to local authorities they're under duty to provide information and advice. Now there was a um was it the third age or an organization called Independent Age and they did like a secret shopper exp um of local authorities, their advice lines, and it was published in Community Care. And I'm going back maybe two years ago, um, but they, they, I mean, it's shocking that they found, uh, and I am making this statistic up by the way, because uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was something like you know, two thirds or three quarters of local authorities, um, when the secret shopper called up for information and advice, the helpline person told them to Google it. They, they told them to Google it. That, that was the standard answer. Um, and I know when I've, sometimes I get kind of random calls from people, the general population looking for an advocate and I'll try and find them an advocate. And when I call the local authority up and say who provides advocacy, I've been told to Google it more times than I care to admit, which is quite shocking really, given that there's this legal duty to provide information and advice. Chris has said me too. Yeah, it is. It's astounding. Um, get, get, you know, this is not something that's best practice. It's a legal duty. Um, so again, you know, we kind of fall back on what we we're saying before about as advocates, what you do with that. Uh, gather your data. Get always get your data. Get get that intelligence ready to show commissioners on this day, you know, or in in this quarter, you know, eighteen times we ran for information advice and we're told to you either told wrong information or confused information or no information find out and feed that in um and and that i do think longer term there's something as for us as a sector to come together to, to look at this and, and comment on the the, the state of care uh, and this is one area that um is problematic because people aren't given the correct information and advice um and I think I remember one lady with um, an advocate with support nurse, she had dementia and she was really um, upset and I think I'd, I'd even, the advocate used the word frightened because she called the advice line up for help and because of the information she'd be given on this advice line with no kind of consideration about this lady's condition um, you know she was, a, she was a bit of a wreck after the phone call and the advocate her, the advocate's job really was to to help her simply to access the correct information in a way that, that she understood. So, you know, the local authority, yes, has to provide information advice, but, but also has to um, consider uh, and make adjustments to, 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 to people. 
Um, and that includes information on, on the system and how it works in that area. Um, of which advocacy is part of. So, the, you know, I'm, I'm amazed how many times, you know, I, I call, and it's a simple question, who delivers advocacy under the Care Act in your area? That's kind of the question. And uh, they can't even tell me. Um, but it's not just about how the system works in that area. It's about um, how they access care and support. And then they have to pull, uh, they have to offer information about finances as well. So uh, how to access um, financial advice, uh, which is a big thing if, if you may be uh, responsible for contributing to the cost of, of care and support. Does that make sense? So the, the, these are things that um, broad headings to do with the Care Act that um, I just want to flag up in this session because it's a general overview of what the local authorities should be doing and I don't think they are. So keep an eye on that. Um, oh, right. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. That was a bit of a prompt for, okay, well, yeah, let, 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 let's do this. So, yeah, I was going to ask what, what's it like in your area? Um, Chris has said there's no information on finances and perhaps where to go for financial support. Um, and again, you know, you can feed that in. Um, and if it's specific things, don't forget, you can always access complaint processes. Um, and if it's a particular if it's with an individual, you can write to the monitoring officer to, to, to raise that issue. Anybody else got any experience of um, trying to get information and advice for an individual or even for yourself? I remember ringing up for my uh, family member, she was saying, who needed some support. And um, I asked them if we could do a self, well, I didn't ask them if, I said, you know, we want to do a self-assessment. Can you send me the information? To which the local authority said uh, that they don't offer self-assessments, um, which I don't think was lawful because the Care Act says that they have to. Um, and it was just, incre I was incredulous that this, you know, they were giving me wrong information. Um, yeah, but really, so you might have personal experience um, we, we, and I, I, I did complain about that. I, I sent in a complaint. I could not 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 do anything. I'm sure, you'd be the same. But yeah, uh, what's it like in your area? Any 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 experience? I appreciate if you're new to the advocacy care at role, then you might not um, got experience. Yes. So Chris has said absolutely nothing is given to people regarding applications, the court of protection, and that sort of thing. Okay. So that's going to come under the Mental Capacity Act, um, but there are rights to, you know, duties on um, decision makers to inform people subject to deprivation of liberties or, you know, any provision of the Capacity Act that they are given information about that and how to access the Court of Protection. Um, but yeah, and even if you think about advocacy, it's not given to people, is it? Um, yeah. Emily said, trying to get information on advocacy services has been very difficult in the past. Locally, the North Wales Advocacy Network has been set up and we do develop in a directory. The general reaction seems to be, why has this not been done before? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and it had, the truth is, it has been done before. I mean, we've had um, a lot of, um, of course, I sound like Silver Black, and Laura, a lot of, let's go. Um, th there have been organisations, so um, there have been networks in, Wale in Wales and in England and nationally um, where you could find an advocate, you'd put in your postcode and up, up they come. Um, but they, those have closed basically because of, of funding problems. Um, but yeah, if we, we do need it, don't we? Yeah. But I mean, we're talking about if you call your local authority, if you if you call up Flintshire and say, and sorry, um, if you're in Wales, it's not the Care Act, is it? The social. Ah, I've been talking about the Care Act here. We need to do something special about the Social um, Care and Wellbeing Act in Wales. Um, okay, leave that with me. I mean, they're very, very similar. There's nothing here. Um, Emily, I'm going to start this bit again. Are you working in Wales under the Social Act, um, Social Care and Wellbeing Act? Okay. Um, are, you, are you working in Wales or in England? For the CHC, so the Community Health um, Council in Wales. Okay. Um, 
I, I think for that, we, you'll be okay then with this general theme. So in Wales, it's called, I'm type it here, the social, um, and well, the act. Okay, uh, it's very similar provisions. Um, the language is going to be different, and all the written information here is about the English Care Act. So the numbers to, uh, that that that's not going to happen in Wales. But if you're working as a complaints advocate and you just want to feel the Care Act provision and Social Care and Wellbeing Act provision in Wales, then the content's fine. This will be okay. Uh, gosh, note to self: check if we've got any Welsh learners on, and then we can. Um, I'd have used a different presentation. It's a bit late now. Sorry, that's my fault. Um, okay, let, let's move on. Now, the advocacy entitlements are, 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 are very similar. They just use um, different language. In the Welsh Act, it talks about professional advocacy. So it talks about independent professional advocates. Um, and in the English legislation, it just talks about advocacy under the Care Act. So... Um, it's like text difference, but um, it's essentially the same. But I'll 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 stick with the slides for now. I'll go through the English model. Um, okay. So the the way to remember advocacy is I don't know if anybody is like into football, um, but the way I remember it is through the classic formation of a football team, which is four four two. I don't know if that means anything to you. Four four two. So you've got four defenders, four midfielders, and two strikers. Um, tell me if this makes any sense. <laughs> if not, um, it's just sorry. Remember it. So you got four, four, two, like a football team, um, and the 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 four and the four and the two in social in the care act advocacy, you've got the four groups of people where advocacy is um, has to be offered to, and that's the adults with the care and support needs themselves. You've got the carers of those adults. Then you've got children who approach in transition and the carers of, of children in transition. And they're basically in order of how big they will be. So you've got um, the, the, the biggest number of people you'll be supporting as an advocate under the Care Act will be uh, the adults with the care and support needs themselves. Then the second biggest one will be the carers of those adults. A smaller number will be children going through transition, and even smaller number will be the carers of those children in transition. We know without doubt that these three groups, the bottom three, are just not getting advocacy. They're not getting um, and they're not being supported to access it. And um, there are problems with the adults getting um, access, but we did a Freedom of Information in England to find out how many people actually got an advocate. And when we came to look at the data for the for young people and carers, um, it, it's really shocking. Um, out of, I think, a third of local authorities who replied, we're talking less than 10 uh, people across the country got, got an advocate um, if you were in transition. So young people are just not getting it. And carers, there's huge gaps of it not being commissioned properly. Um, or be other than being referred. So th there are issues here. Um, but for now, if we're looking at eligibility, they're the four groups of people who have to be offered it. The second four, so they're the, that's your back four, 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 two. Uh, the second four is four decision-making processes. So if you've got one of these people, groups of people, going through one of these processes, um, then they have to consider advocacy. And the four processes are the assessment process, so assessing somebody's eligible needs, uh, the care and support plan and process, which takes place after they've established they've got eligible needs. Um, after the plan, the, the plan has to be reviewed, so that's the third decision-making process. And the fourth decision-making process is safeguarding, and that includes safeguarding inquiries and safeguarding adult reviews. Now, we go into detail uh, in each of these four um, decision making areas in different webinars so that we can dig a bit deeper into what the Care Act says uh, and also what the advocacy role is. Um, but for now, we're just looking at who gets one. So four groups of people going through one of four decision making processes. And then the two is that there are two conditions have to be met and they both have to be met. 
The first one is that they have substantial difficulty in being fully involved within the process itself. And there's no one appropriate and available to support and represent them. Now, both of these things need a bit more unpicking, um, which is what we're going to do now on a couple of slides. So substantial difficulty, that's what this slide is about. So does the person face substantial difficulty at going through this, this process? Um, and there's four areas where somebody might find difficulty. Uh, understanding or re retaining the information, using the information to, to weigh up consequences and choices, or they might have difficulty in communicating uh, their views, wishes and feelings. Now, this mirrors the capacity um, the, the, Christ, you, um, the test to see if you've got capacity. We're under the capacity test. You have to, it has to be established that you can't do one of these things. The substantial difficulty just means that you, you, might find, you might find it difficult without support to do these. So we're talking about people who have capacity to make decisions, but struggle with these things. So we're thinking around people who might have a learning disability and might need uh, additional time to, to, to go through information or might need information given an easy read um, or particular adjustments to be made. Um, but they've got capacity. Uh, there's no question that they can make decisions. They just need support to make decisions. Um, but it also includes people who lack capacity. So if you can't do one of these four things, then it follows that you, know, you hit that criteria of substantial difficulty because you can't do it. Of course, you're going to have difficulty in doing it then. So as a care act advocate, um, you need to be prepared to work with the whole range of, of um, need, if you will, from people who have capacity but need some help right through to people who lack capacity and might not even be aware that there's a, an assessment taking place or might not be aware that there is a care plan being, being reviewed, for instance. The second of the, the, the conditions is that they, they have to um, lack somebody who is appropriate and available to support them. And the guidance in the CARE Act goes a little bit, gives us some um, pointers on what this means. And what, it's, what, the, what they're basically saying is that it's not enough that this person just loves the person or knows them very well, that actually, it's about helping their active involvement and not everybody can do that and if you think about um, people with um, I don't know I, I think of myself as a mum to be, to be honest you know can I support my child to be actively involved in decisions about his life and sometimes but sometimes I can't because I have such a strong view on what I think should happen that I can't support his involvement because I'm too busy being involved in what I think should happen. So I'm representing my voice, not his voice. Now, if the two voices are saying the same things, it's easy, but if they're not, then it's difficult. And if you think about this at bottom bit here, that's what the Care Act guidance is getting at. So if you've got somebody who's saying that they're, they're supporting the individual, but actually what they're doing is they're putting forward their view and not the individual's view, then that means that the individual could be, should be entitled to, to an advocate to help them. doesn't mean that the parent or the family member doesn't have a say or can't put forward their own view. It just means that advocacy is triggered. And there are other things that, that has to happen. Um, and if it doesn't, then advocacy is triggered. Uh, and these are like really obvious, but you'd be amazed how many times it doesn't happen. Um, the first one is that they have to agree to offer this support. So they have to be asked, will you you know, act, are you able to actively involve this person in, in the process? And they have to agree. They have to be able to do, to do that. Um, and then this is, again, an obvious one. If, if they're not appropriate, so if they are suspective of um, any abuse or safeguarding issues, then they're not appropriate to, to support the individual. Um, which is a very, very kind of high threshold if, if that makes sense, that, you know, it, not everybody's going to, lots of people are going to have people in their lives, Well, not everybody's going to have somebody who can do this active involvement. And if they don't, then advocacy should be triggered. Now, to give you a feel um, for um, figures, the local authority, uh, Department of Health, sorry, 
issued a, an impact assessment at the uh, when the care act was being implemented where it predicted how many people would have an advocate and it predicted that seven percent of people going through care act assessments um would have an advocate so I'll say that again seven percent of people going through assessments under the care act would have an advocate the first thing i would do if i were you is to talk to your service about getting data from your commissioner your local authority to find out how many people had assessments last year do a freedom of information find out how many people had assessments you know how many people you work with through the assessments and work it out did did seven percent of people in your local area have an advocate and um, if they did brilliant you're kind of doing it you know well done local authority well done advocacy service but if you didn't um, and in some areas it's as low as 0.2 percent 0.2 percent um then i think you've got really strong legs to go back and talk to them about um them discharging their duties to make advocacy available does that make sense I've been going on a bit now. Listen to my dulcet tones. We're nearly there at the end. Um, okay, there are two additional areas. So we've done the 442, four groups of people going through four decision making processes, and then the two conditions. But then the Care Act extends it a little bit, pushes it even more. And it says that even where that person might have somebody appropriate, um, but they're considering placing that person in the care home. So remember, this, this is for people who lack capacity and for people with capacity, just substantial difficulty. Um, if they're thinking around uh, moving them to a care home and it's in their best interest, then they can have an advocate. And this really mirrors IMCA, except it, it's pushing the, the, kind of the, the people who are entitled to IMCA um, for ch long term change of accommodation. This is pushing it to people who have capacity but face substantial difficulty. And then the other one is if there's a disagreement between the local authority and the person's appropriate person, and they both agree that an advocate's helpful, then they can have an advocate. I don't know any anyone in the whole country who's ever had an advocate appointed under the, either of these. Um, so for people listening, have, have you ever, is your service ever received a referral under one of these two um, criteria? um because i've never i've never known it and um you know that's interesting really because that means that people aren't getting them or it probably means that people aren't getting them and they are entitled to an advocate so that's something again for us to be thinking about okay quick slide on the advocacy role because this is from the guidance um, and it's very uncontroversial. It's advocacy. What I wanted to make the point here is that advocacy under the Care Act is exactly the same as all other types of advocacy, whether you're a complaints advocate, whether you're an IMHA, whether you're an IMCA, children's advocate, the, the, the role of the advocate is voice, choice and rights. It's self-advocacy, it's representational advocacy if the person wants it or needs it. And it's about making sure that the, they are heard through that decision making process. So advocacy under the Care Act is no different. It's exactly the same. Um, but specifically, it's going to be about the Care Act processes. So a bit like IMHA is going to be about mental health processes. The Care Act is about the assessment, the planning, the meeting of your eligible needs. And this is what the guidance says, which is all absolutely fine it's about understanding the process and something rights making decisions yeah you know the, the self-advocacy of communicating views and um, access and records so as an advocate you um, can access records with your partner or if they lack capacity and um, you have a right to access them on their behalf and then there's this duty to challenge decisions which don't promote well-being and um, which um, we cover in a bit more detail uh, in the other webinars so for now I'll, I'll just i'll just leave it at that that it's um but all of these are standard advocacy roles nothing controversial it's exactly the same advocacy under the care act okay so a slide to finish on um to go back to the the problems that we've got nationally uh, and i'll leave this slide up um so if you want to 
take a screenshot or, or write it down do um but yeah i would talk to your managers and trustees around keeping some data on these the, the first two so the number of fails you receive and then the number of fails you receive and go on to support and then ask the local authority to record the number of times advocacy is offered and not taken up because I think you'd want to know why. Is that because of um, problems with diversity that the particular groups aren't finding your service accessible? Is it because of capacity? Is it because of a lack of referral? Um, is it because of a lack of, you know, why is it that, 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 that they're not? And then number four, I would ask the local authority to record the number of times advocacy is requested by a person and refused. Now, I don't think for a second that the local authority captured this data, by the way, um, but I think it's helpful for them too, and they're not going to unless we ask them. So ask them uh, ask them to record when it's requested and, and when it's refused, and what happens if, if that decision is that no, they're not entitled? Where, where does that person go to? My gut feeling, uh, my cynical feeling, is that advocacy just simply isn't offered and people aren't informed about their rights to advocacy. Um, but we need data if we're going to do anything about that. So that's kind of why I'm suggesting this um, emphasis on recording if, if you're involved in delivering advocacy. Okay, so at the end of the slides, um, gosh, we've got one minute to three to go. Uh, I don't mind staying past three though, if, if you've got questions. Um, but we've covered some of the main things on the Care Act. So it's dealing with um, adult services for, for care and support. It deals with assessments and planning. It talks about um, putting in support for preventing the onset of need. It um, puts carer's rights on an equal footing with the cared for person and it introduces rights to advocacy. And then we've just looked at the advocacy entitlements. Uh, and in Wales, it's uh, an independent professional advocacy role, but it's the same entitlement, the same conditions of um, facing substantial difficulty and not having anybody appropriate and available to support. Uh, so it's not for everybody, but um, it's quite, you know, 7% of people going through assessments, they expect it to have an advocate. Um, so that, that you know, it's big, big numbers. So any questions or, or comments from you guys before we finish? Emily said, I have a question about the appropriate person bit. Whose responsibility is it to assess whether a representative is appropriate? Is it down to the social worker or whoever to decide? A great question. Um, so the, the, the duty is on the local authority to uh, arrange advocacy for eligible people. So the bottom line is it's up to the social worker. Yeah. Um, so I'm aware in some areas that there are arrangements for the advocacy service to make the decision. Um, I can't think of a problem with that, other than if the local, if the advocacy service says no, you're not appropriate, and the person wants to kind of challenge that decision, um, they might be getting advocacy to challenge a decision made by the advocacy service. So that's a bit, bit weird. Um, but yeah, it, it will be up to the local authority to decide. Um, it's their duty. So it's their duty to arrange advocacy, provide advocacy, uh, commission advocacy. Uh, so yes, yeah, their responsibility to assess whether somebody is appropriate. And the things they'd be looking at uh, would be, are they able to, are they willing to, are there any safeguarding concerns? Um, does the person want them to? Of course, I didn't say that. You might get somebody... Um, this happens a lot where they assume somebody's going to take on a role and nobody's asked the person, you know, nobody said, do you want your mum to, to help you through this? Um, and they may or may not, you know, they may or may not. I remember a mum coming to me on, I was speaking at a conference on the, and about character advocacy and she came afterwards and said her son, her adult son was going through a process and she said, uh, everyone assumes I'm going to be his advocate. To which, you know, I, I kind of said, well, yeah, I can, I can see why you're beautiful natural advocate you stick up for him and you know his needs like nobody else knows his needs and uh, she said she said yeah she said I want to be involved I just I want him to have a separate advocate who's just there for him without my agenda and kind of bias or what I think he needs and in a way 
it's straightforward because all she had to do was say, I, I'm, I'm not willing to be the advocate. I'm not willing to be that voice. And she doesn't lose any rights to still be involved. It's just that advocacy then has to be offered. So advocacy then is then offered to the son and it's up to him if he's got capacity to, to, to say he wants one, um, then that's fine. He, he has one. He, he gets to choose. Does that, that answer your question? Going for the long questions today. I don't think I've spoken to anybody this morning. <laughs> My rambling. Um, okay, good. Any other questions or comments about anything that we've covered? So today was really like it's meant to be a bit of a, an introduction to the Care Act. If you are going to be a care advocate, I'd strongly recommend you jump on the other webinars to do a Care Act advocacy. Um, and Emily, I. I'm going to send you some stuff about Wales, about the Social and Wellbeing Act. In fact, I need to write that down. Is anybody else in Wales? Send Welsh. I know you're not going to be a Care Act advocate uh, or in a professional advocate under the Social Wellbeing Act in, in Wales, but I'll still send you some stuff, Emily. Um, anybody else in Wales? No. All right, then, well, if there's no other questions or comments, I shall bid you farewell. And um, yeah, I hope that's been useful. I'm just nosing in <laughs> because there's a bit coming up. That means you have a complaints advocacy role for social care as well. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's been a big drive, hasn't there, to get advocacy for social care complaints similar to NHS complaints. Uh, so some local authorities do commission it, but it's not a duty. Um, so yeah, if it, Grace, that, that, that that's good. Right. Well, I'll, I'll still send you some stuff so, so that you've, you've you've got it to hand. But um, if it's just an overview that everything that the, the themes that we've covered, it's the same in Wales. Great. Okay then. Well, um, good luck with everything, and hopefully, so we're going to do these every Wednesday. So jump on as many as as you fancy, and they'll be recorded now with um, subtitles. That should be in. The, the system Friday, I think, it takes 48 hours to, to get them uploaded. Um, and you can dip in and out if, if you want. Um, otherwise, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see you soon. Okay, take care, guys. Bye. Bye.